Please be seated. Oh, that great song by Thomas Dorsey. Precious Lord, take my hand. Gregory, do you know in that book, Stranded? Stranded is a book that, in which music writers talk about the albums they have to have if they're stranded on a desert island. Their most favorite music. And one of those albums, did you know that? Is uh, Thomas Dorsey. Precious Lord, take my hand. Today's sermon is entitled, The Still Small Voice. You heard John read the scripture. You heard the punchline in the new Revised Standard Version. And it said that Elijah heard the sound of sheer silence. But in the King James Version that many of us grew up with, the phrase is different. It says that Elijah heard the sound of a still small voice. And that's what the title of the sermon comes from. Elijah. Elijah is still all around us. Every time you hear the song, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, that song comes from the story of Elijah. If you ever hear a woman in a deprecating way referred to as a Jezebel, that comes from the story of Elijah. If you ever hear a reference to painted ladies, that comes from the story of Elijah. If you ever hear someone talk about passing the mantle, that comes from the story of Elijah. Because Elijah used to wear a mantle. Now, you may think a mantle is an architectural feature around a fireplace. But this word refers to a robe. And it wasn't just any robe, it was a robe made out of bear skins. Elijah wore a robe made out of bear skins. And when it was time for him to appoint his successor, and Elijah's successor was named Elisha. Elijah took his bear skin cloak and put it on the shoulders of Elisha. So that's what passing the mantle is. So Elijah is one of the incredible figures in the Old Testament. The intensity and passion and extremity of feeling of Elijah. Elijah would make you feel uncomfortable. He wore a bearskin robe. He lived out in the wilderness. He had visions all the time. He was involved in violence in his life. I'm trying to think who I should compare Elijah to, and you could understand. A little bit, uh, uh, some comparison would be to John Brown. You know the story of John Brown, the abolitionist who was prophetic and was fighting for the poor, in that case, the slaves, and yet he wanted, he resorted to violence to do it. Elijah was that kind of character. Elijah was from another time. Elijah should be one of the biblical superheroes for Bible school. Elijah is famous in legend. In Jewish tradition, Elijah is thought to be one of two people who never died. The other is Enoch, who is an obscure character back in Genesis. But it says in the Bible that Elijah didn't die. Rather, he went down to the Jordan River. He laid his bare skin down on the water. The waters parted. He walked across the water. And then it says, a band of angels came after him and took him up to heaven in a chariot. 
Since, according to the Jewish legend, Elijah never died, Elijah still shows up. Right, Nancy? And at every Seder meal, when they have their, their meal on the first night of Passover, they leave an empty chair for Elijah. And every time there's a bris, and a bris is the Jewish word for a circumcision ceremony, they also leave a chair for Elijah. In Iraq, and I know a little bit about Iraqi Christianity now because our dear friend Mother Olga is an Iraqi Christian. In Iraq, the Christians believe that Elijah can help bring the rain, still. He's like one of the saints you can pray to. Elijah, the rainmaker, Elijah, the guest at every Jewish ceremony, also, in Jewish tradition, there are many legends about how Elijah always is out there still, since he never died, protecting the poor. Elijah is the champion of the poor. Now, as you know, I recently returned from the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, which is the home of the Lakota tribe. And so now I have a new person to compare to Elijah. Elijah was like Crazy Horse. Crazy Horse was actually born with a different name. His parents originally gave him the name the Wilderness One because they thought there was something wild about him. Elijah lived in the wilderness. There was a time in the wilderness one's young life when he went to the Lakota sacred place in the Black Hills of what we know as South Dakota. And in those Black Hills, this young Lakota warrior had a vision. And in that vision, he saw himself riding on a horse. And the horse was dancing. And he came back and told that story to people. And they said, so now your name is Crazy Horse. And Crazy Horse was trying to protect the Lakota people and their land from the U.S. Cavalry. And finally, in June 1865, when the 7th Cavalry, led by George Custer, came to the creek called Little Bighorn, Crazy Horse led a group of Cheyenne and Lakota warriors, and they defeated the cavalry. And then Crazy Horse went off with his warriors. But still, by that time, the cavalry was enclosing the Lakota people. You know, the way they lived was to hunt buffalo. And there were so many soldiers, they couldn't get to their buffalo. And over the course of the next two years, their people was star were starving. And so finally, Crazy Horse brought his people on to a fort and said, I'm not surrendering, but I can't see my people starve. And so he was taken to a place called Fort Robinson, Nebraska. Crazy Horse was never defeated. Crazy Horse never gave up, but because of the starvation of his people, he felt like he had to bring them in where they would receive food from the army. And while he was in Fort Robinson, the soldiers felt he was a threat and said, we have to lock you up. Oh, you weren't reacting to Crazy Horse. So they started escorting Crazy Horse to the prison. And something happened along the way 
there was some kind of scuffle, there was some kind of conflict, and those guards uh, bayoneted Crazy Horse and killed him. But the Lakotas say that Crazy Horse just refused to be caged. And so before they could put him in prison, he provoked their assault upon him because he would not live bound. Crazy horse. Elijah. Elijah lived in the wilderness. Elijah had a vision. His vision was not of a crazy horse. It was of a crazy chariot in the sky with angels and he saw that vision throughout his life Elijah fought against the unjust appropriation of land by the government do you know the story of Naboth's vineyard there was a man named Naboth a humble man he had a vineyard a beautiful farm and King Ahab and Queen Jezebel wanted it. And Elijah showed up and said, No, you can't take poor people's land just because you're more powerful. And Elijah was involved in some battles. A battle with the priests of Baal. So Elijah, crazy horse, that's what's on my mind this morning after my experience at Pine Ridge. Now let's talk about this story. Elijah goes to, it says, if you still have your Bibles open, the cave. What does it say there? Uh, do we have it by any chance? At that place, you came to a cave and spent the night there. All right. Just so we're clear, you're going to get a little Old Testament class today. In the Hebrew, of, it doesn't say he came to a cave. He came to the cave. Do you know what that cave is? That's the same cave on Mount Sinai where the Lord appeared to Moses. Do you remember the story about how Moses said, Lord, can I see your glory? And the Lord said, you can't see my glory. And Moses said, please. He says, okay, I'm going to put you in the cleft of a rock. I'm going to put you in a cave and cover your, fa your face with my hand, and then I'll pass by. Elijah's going to the same place. Elijah is going to a place where God has appeared before. Elijah's going to his sacred place in his tribe, his Black Hills. And there, Elijah is expecting to get the same kind of powerful religious experience Moses got. Do you remember what happened to Moses on Mount Sinai? There was lightning, there was thunder, there was earthquake. So that's what Elijah wants. But when he get, and then when, he, when Elijah gets there, it says, the Lord passed by. And there was an earthquake. But the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And there was a rainstorm. But the Lord wasn't in the rainstorm. And there was lightning. But the Lord wasn't in the lightning. And then it says, there was a still small voice and that's where the Lord was a still small voice the sound of sheer silence I think the best way to translate it from the Hebrew is to say the sound of a thin whisper Elijah heard a sound like you would hear if you put a shell to your ear a conch and you hear the wind. Can you hear them? Blow through it. That's where God was. And then God said, All right, Elijah, I've got your attention. 
in a new way, I want you to go. Oh, the psychology of this story. Elijah goes to Mount Sinai, also called Mount Horeb, because he wants the big, powerful religious experience he had before. Elijah has expectations. Elijah is yearning and longing. Was there ever something powerful and beautiful and strong in your life that's now missing and you want it? And you go back to the same place it always was because you expect to get that powerful dose of the holy, of the beautiful, of love that you got before. But don't you know that those kind of intense expectations often lead to depressing disappointment? God says to Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah says, I have been very zealous for the Lord. I've been working hard. I've been doing everything right. And now, Elijah says, I've been left alone all by myself. And they seek to take my life. Oh, those kind of expectations and longings and desires we have lead often to disappointment and then they lead to self-pity. Have you ever said, why me? And what's the second word of that phrase? Me. <laughs> me, me, me. And it's interesting, you can't see it. Your translation doesn't do a good job with it. But in the Hebrew it says, Elijah says, now I am left alone, me, by myself. It says it twice, me, by myself. You can see how when things go wrong, when you feel like you're not getting the result you deserve, when you've been, as uh, the rascals might sing, lonely too long, you, you feel so self-absorbed and that's where Elijah is he's in that place but God is in a new place and in this story God gets Elijah's attention in new ways last week the sermon was about a time when Jacob wrestled with God a very powerful experience where you feel God's presence, even if it's dangerous. Well, this story is not about a wrestling, but a rustling of wind. This vision of God that Elijah has is not about the trampling hooves of celestial horses. It's about the trembling of a leaf in the wind. God may not appear to you like he did before. You should understand that. If you are just trying to recreate, if you're trying to go back, if you're trying to find the same thing you had but lost, God may not be in the earthquake anymore. This time God might be in the still small voice. God may be trying to get your attention in a new way. As life goes on, we need new skill sets for being aware of God. New skill sets for being aware of God. And there's another thing I wanted to say about this text, if you don't mind me pointing out the Hebrew. Three times in your translations, there's a word missing. In verse 9, 
Um, do you have it, Diane? Will you read verse 9 for us? Okay, did you hear behold? Behold wasn't in the new RSV, but behold is there. And then in verse 13. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and he said, What are you doing here, Elijah? There's our behold, and it wasn't in the NRSV. And there's one other place in this story where it has the word behold. Now, have you ever thought about the word behold? It's a Bible word. I don't know when the last time you heard it in a conversation was. But let's just pause. All over the Bible, there's this word behold. People are walking down the street and then it will say, behold. A behold is an exclamation point experience. A behold is a time when all of a sudden the light gets brighter. And in the Bible, in the middle of descriptions, it will say this was happening then. Behold. I don't know if you ever have behold experiences. A behold experience is not the time to get out your cell phone. A behold experience is not a time to take a selfie. <laughs> a behold experience is just in the middle of everyday life, all of a sudden, you're awake. You're alert. You're alive. It's a surge of spiritual adrenaline. Elijah goes to Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, because he wants earthquake. He wants revival. He wants this big, dramatic spiritual experience. And all around him are little beholds. All around him are times when he is beheld. He's grabbed by the urgency and vitality of life. If he'll just wake up. But you see, you're not going to notice if you're always looking to repeat what you had before. Because God is going to use a new way to get your attention. At the end of this story, in the final verse... You know, Elijah's been feeling sorry for himself. I'm the only one. There's nobody but me, all by myself. And the last verse here, can you read it, Dan? You've been doing a great job. Yet I will need 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to God, and every mouth that has not kissed him. I'm going to leave. Say, Elijah, God says, I'm leaving 7,000 who haven't bent the knees to Baal, to Baal. You're not the only one. I know you feel like the only one, but you're not the only one. There's a beautiful poem by a man named Gregory Corso from 1958. I want you to pay attention to this, boys. Gregory Corso was one of the beatnik poets. Gregory Corso hung around with Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg, and he was kind of a hippie before they had hippies. They didn't have hippies till the 60s. In the 50s, they called them beatniks. And Gregory Corso was a beatnik, and he wrote a poem about marriage. And it's the poem of a young man who's worried, will I ever get married? Will I ever find someone? And in the poem, the, the writer says, should I get married? And then he says, I don't want to marry a girl who's like my mother, and Ingrid Bergman's already taken, and maybe there's a girl now, but she's already married, and I don't like men, and there's got to be somebody. 
Because what if I'm 60 years old and not married, all alone in a furnished room with pea stains on my underwear? That's what he says, Greg Corso. And everybody else married. All the universe married but me. All about me. Me, myself. All alone. It never worked out. How come I don't have it? And then, at the end, Greg Corso says, And yet, well I know that as I am possible, a woman is possible. And so marriage is possible. That if I feel this way, if I'm who I am, there has to be somebody else who's like that too. Elijah, oh Lord, what about me? And Elijah says, buddy, I've got 7,000 other people too. You are not alone. You are not alone in longing. You are not alone in suffering. You are not alone in worry about the poor. You're not alone in widowhood. You're not alone in widowerhood. You are not alone in feeling dizzy before a whirlwind of changes. Look around, please, right now. Look around, daggone it. You're not alone. Just like you are possible, these people are possible. And if we could just pull together, and be the family, the people of God, we can make a beautiful garden to beautify the Lord. Amen.